Hello and welcome to the third day of the week-long Art and Environmental Justice Symposium. My name is Netanel Portier. I'm director of the Mural Arts Institute, a program of Mural Arts Philadelphia and producers of this event. I'm located in Philadelphia, the land of the Lenape peoples. I'm a white middle-aged woman with short brown bob and baby bangs brown eyes and dark eyebrows. I'm wearing a dark v-neck shirt with some flowers. I'm sitting in my living room downstairs um, with the staircase to my right behind me. As I welcome you with the land acknowledgement, if you'd like, please take a moment to share in the chat your pronouns, your name, where you're joining us from, uh, and anything else you'd like to share with us today. We acknowledge that the land on which we live and labor were stolen from the Lenni Lenape peoples and their descendants who survived and remained in the homeland in addition to those in the diaspora who were forcefully removed as far as Oklahoma, Wisconsin and Canada and are still marginalized even today in the city of brotherly love. Registration to the symposium was free, but please find links to the tribal governments and indigenous organizations on Lenni Lenape land Philadelphia in the chat and consider donating and learning more in the spirit of reciprocity and reparations. I'm honored today to introduce you to Lael Camargo, who will be facilitating our conversation today, reflecting upon how arts-based strategies can disrupt, educate, and support community-centered decision-making and imagination. Lael Camargo is a cultural strategist, land steward, filmmaker, and artist, is a descendant of the Yaqui tribe and Mayo tribes of the Sonoran Desert. Lael is transgender and non-binary person. They graduated from UC Santa Cruz with dual degrees in feminist studies and legal studies. Lael was the impact producer for the North Pole show, season two with executive producer Rosario Dawson. They currently produce and host Did We Go Too Far, a podcast with an eco ecological justice organization movement generation. As the Ecological Arts and Culture Manager at the Center for Cultural Power, Lyell created alongside Fabiana Rodriguez, Climate Woke, a national campaign to center BIPOC voices in climate justice. Due to wanting to shape a new world, they co-founded Shelterwood Collective, a land-based organization that teaches land stewardship, creative envisioning, and healing for long-term survival. Lyell was a transformative justice practitioner for six years and still finds ways to bring their lessons and alternatives to the carceral system to all their work. Most recently, Lyell was named on the GRIST 2020 Fixers list, as well as celebrated by Yerba Buena Center of the Arts list of people to watch out for in 2019. Thank you so much for being with us here today, Lyell, um, and I will hand this off to you to get us started. Thanks, Netana. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm calling in from Wichita territory of the Ohlone lands, also known as the Bay Area. I'm super excited to be here with you all to discuss such a unseen yet such a big culprit, which is air pollution and air quality and specifically about the arts. I'm going to introduce three amazing folks that are going to be on our panel today. First off, we have Dr. Catherine Garupa White. Um, she is the executive director of the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition, spearheading policy advocacy for clean air in California, San Joaquin Valley, one of the nation's most polluted and unequal places. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Catherine. We also have Kim Abelis. Uh, Kim Abelis is an artist who explores society, science, literacy, feminism, and the environment, creating projects with science and natural history museums, health departments, air pollution, control agencies, national park services and nonprofits, the list just goes on. And also Rostin Wu, who is a designer, a writer and an educator currently living in Los Angeles, also known as Tongva territory. He produces civic scale arts works and works as a collaborator and a consultant to a variety of grassroots and nonprofit organizations. Thanks y'all, thank you so much for being here. So I, the reason why I'm talking about this is I've had the pleasure of also creating some work around air quality. And I'm really excited to hear from each of you, um, what brought you to the topic of air? And I'm wondering if we can start with Kim Abelis and then, then we'll go through the list. Okay, should I present now or just 
answer your question basically i could present and it would get me to that answer if you like oh my god i would love if you could present actually i'll pass it over so each of you could present and then we'll go into the questions that's a great start okay thank you Let's see so i should be sharing is that right you are it looks great Oh, great. Thank you very much for letting me know that. Yeah, I, I actually I did this so that I could answer your question. Um, and uh, we were asked to describe ourselves also. So I'm a white woman with graying hair and a, I guess a rusty color shirt and, and a black top over it uh, and all my lucky jewelry. So um, I've been doing environmental work for quite a while and uh, I've dealt with different topics. A lot of it has to do with the infrastructure uh, and teaching people about, especially in urban areas, how, how that system works. In this case, it's with the storm drain system. I also do social justice and its relationship to environment also. Uh, these are actually shoes of the civil rights marchers, a collection I was able to tap into in Atlanta. And what's of interest here is the role of the individual and our role as individuals within community. Consumption is a big part of how I tackle any of these projects. Uh, this paper person is based on the amount of trash generated by visitors. Its scale is 45 by 48 feet. And you can see from this detail, the scale of the hand of the paper person to the hand of us as installers. The smog work really came out of um, my entire life and childhood. Uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh and this is actually Pittsburgh at three in the afternoon. And this was taken about 10 years before I was born, but I grew up in Pittsburgh when the, uh, the steel industry was really still in full force. So the smog problem was really intense uh, throughout you know, my high school and middle school experiences, for instance. So um, I'm putting these two photos in because I, I went to actually to undergraduate school in southeastern Ohio, and I lived in this grain silo that had been converted into a house. And the I lived off the land. I did a lot of experimentation with the natural vegetation that was around. And I'm showing you this because right in the middle of this photograph is actually the grain silo I just showed you. And I moved from there to here in downtown Los Angeles. And of course, the impact is pretty profound for anybody moving into an urban area after living in a rural area. So when I first moved there in 78, everybody, when I would mention about the smog and my lungs hurting, they would say, oh, Kim, that's, that's fog, that's not smog. So one day I looked out my fire escape, uh, this was in the mid kind of early 80s, and I saw the San Gabriel Mountains at the end of the street on Broadway. You can see it meshed between the, you know, buildings on the left and right. And for I decided to see when I could see it clearly again. And it took me a year and two months. So I built this bellows of a camera housing all those efforts to see the mountain clearly. And I decided in the end, a painting of that mountain wedge was really more to my memory of seeing it for the first time. So you can see it uh, suspended in front of that bellows of a camera. And so I just got so attached to that mountain that I decided on a first smog alert day when it's very smoggy out and very dangerous for anybody with asthma or any kind of health problems, I decided to walk there from my studio downtown. It was a 10, took me 10 hours. It was a 16 and a half mile walk, but I went as the crow flies, which meant if I had to cut through people's houses, I had to knock on their doors and convince them to let me do that. 
The first smog collector actually came out of this project. And I hope you can see that's the same shape of the mountain wedge that I was fixated on with that uh, earlier mountain wedge project. So this was the first smog collector. And the process is actually that I make a stencil and I place them on objects and then on my rooftop. And smog is very heavy. It's made out of heavy metals. It's made out of small particles that run off the tire uh, as it hits the road. Of course, if near factories, there's different factory emissions. So the stencils are cut and then placed on the rooftop. And then when I remove the stencil, that image is made from the smog. So a lot of the projects that I've done have to do with domestic life, our feeling that we're sort of safe in our homes. Uh, this is my daughter's high chair and bassinet with her toys made out of smog and her little sandwich made out of smog. Uh, done different renditions of them. Uh, the, it's very good to have the small collectors for people to talk about an issue they just don't want to talk about. So it's really a lot of the reason that I've continued. Some of the pieces have to do with our relationship again to the home and to the factories that surround us. And as another example, this one has a photo of an electric car company from the early 1900s. And we really did fail early to understand how profoundly dangerous the Industrial Revolution was. People knew it, even leaders knew about it, but nobody really wanted to act in a different way. Some of the projects are more citywide. They really refer, in this case, making sculptures out of car mufflers and catalytic converters with smog stencils so that people could actually watch that smog being collected. These were placed in various parts of the city so you could begin to understand that in some areas, the smog is well, there's smog everywhere, folks. It always seems like it's somewhere else, but definitely in areas where there is wealth, they try to protect from things like factories or freeways moving through. The projects have been done with all age groups. These are little kids. These are like kindergartners. Um, and again, it, it has always been a way to generate conversation and not only conversation of, hey, there's smog out there, but this idea that there are problems, there are social problems related to it, and we do have solutions. And it's really important in these workshops to go through all the different you know, levels of discussion on it. Sometimes like in Boulder, the goal of the kids making these smog collectors at the middle school was really so that they would um, have their parents stop idling their cars in front of the school while they waited for them. There have been activity books and different ways of sharing with scientists and artists and translations of photographs that are then made in smog. And here's like the perfect American landscape painting now created in smog. And I'm gonna close actually with two projects, uh, world leaders. These are all the presidents from McKinley to Bush. These are selections from the series. I left them out longer if their environmental records were bad. So that's why Reagan was left out for 40 days and Jimmy Carter, who's still always trying to help us was only left out for four days. And more recently to close out, uh, I worked with a museum in Moscow and I made small collector portraits of 10 different world leaders with their quotes that they've given at climate summits. So part of this for me is leadership can say a lot of stuff, but they really need to show action. And I'll close there. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I think. <clears throat> that is such a great way to transition over um, to the realities that our policy workers and our governments aren't really doing enough. And who better to talk about this work than Dr. Catherine Grover White, who leads an organization on policy pressures that are needed in order to solve the air quality.
Um, thank you all for kind of adjusting with us. I know that you were supposed to go first. Thank you for being flexible, but I'm excited to hear about your work, Dr. Catherine, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us. Greetings and thank you for having me. I'm Catherine, a white woman with long brown and white hair and brown eyes. I'm wearing glasses and a blue dress and I'm sitting in front of bookshelves in my home office. I also have a few slides that I'm gonna use for some visual orientation. So I am an activist scholar by training. I have a master's degree in social work and a PhD in geography. And I started my career as a community organizer with the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition or CVAC for short. So being an activist scholar means that I engage in scholarship in order to inform um, my activism and my activism very much informs what I research and teach about. So the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition works on unceded Yokuts and Miwok land, and our vision is for a healthy, safe, and equal, economically prosperous region where we have eliminated chronic air pollution and the ac epidemic sickness that it causes, which I'll talk briefly about today, very high level overview. Um, and how we seek to achieve this vision is by raising awareness, acting as a watchdog, advocating for policy and mobilizing communities to create clean air in the San Joaquin Valley with an emphasis on communities of color and low income communities that we know are disproportionately impacted because of the concentration of polluting sources in those neighborhoods. So our reputation may precede us. Every year, the American Lung Association puts out their state of the air report and consistently the San Joaquin Valley is ranked at the top. So for ozone pollution, Visalia, Bakersfield, Fresno, Madera, Hanford, those are all cities and metropolitan areas in the San Joaquin Valley. So we are at the top of the list in the nation in terms of ozone pollution. And this is particularly concerning for people because long-term exposure is like getting a sunburn in your lungs. It's a corrosive gas and long-term exposure can um, actually stunt the growth of lungs in children. Particle pollution is also a very pervasive problem in the San Joaquin Valley. And again, we have several metropolitan areas that consistently rank at the top of the list for the most polluted. So lungs uh, and particulate matter, this is just a kind of visualization because a lot of the work that we do is helping make the invisible visible because particles are so tiny that they're, uh, you can't see them um, with, the, with your eyes. Uh, and so we need to help people visualize what this means that these particles are so small that you breathe them in and that they, they get into your lungs and they can cause lung, lung damage, but they, the tiniest particles can actually make their way out of the lungs into the bloodstream, impacting your entire system, particularly your brain um, and your heart. So Alzheimer's, uh, diabetes, all kinds of different problems are associated with it, chronic exposure to air pollution because essentially what it means is that our bodies are inundated by this pollution and our immune systems are consistently inflamed. It really is a year long problem for people in the San Joaquin Valley. Oh, and there's the little visualization of the particles on the heart. So again, recognizing that these impacts are not um, experienced equally, there are five population groups that are particularly important when it comes to protecting people's health. So pregnant people because of the danger of exposure to the fetus, children under the age of 18 because their heart, lung and immune systems are still developing and they tend to respirate faster, which means that they're going to breathe in more of the pollution. People with pre-existing conditions and our elders that are over 65 are also gonna be more susceptible. And a critically important population in the San Joaquin Valley is our farm workers, um, people who work outdoors, who are don't have the luxury of being able to stay inside on unhealthy air days and who often aren't provided the protective equipment even when it's required by law. So in this image, you can see one of the catastrophic wildfires we had a few years ago and farm workers still out in the field with no protective equipment being exposed to incredibly dangerous levels of air pollution without adequate protection. So briefly, the primary causes and also a bit of a visual orientation for those of you not from California, where the San Joaquin Valley is really in the heart of the state. 
So we have several growing metropolitan areas that unfortunately our land use and transportation patterns continue to be sprawling. Um, we also have these major transportation corridors of Interstate 5 and Highway 99 with a lot of heavy duty diesel truck traffic moving in and out. We have a proliferation of warehouses and distribution centers because we have very large ports um, on the coast of California. And so many of those goods that are coming in from China need to travel through the San Joaquin Valley to go to other places. And as just one example, the Southern San Joaquin Valley has an Ikea distribution center, but our entire region, the last I checked, doesn't have an Ikea store. So we are inundated by pollution that is coming from other places and traveling to other places without getting any of the actual resources that are being distributed. Um, so development is, the, is one cause. Another cause is oil energy generation generally, but historically um, the San Joaquin Valley and California have been at the top of the list in terms of oil production. It's only more recently that our position has started to slip a little bit because of the fracking boom. Um, so Kern County alone produces 80% of what the state of California um, extracts out of the ground with very negative impacts and very little, if any, health protections for people living close to these facilities. Um, and again, much of this happens in rural areas. It, people who are at the gas pump aren't necessarily seeing the, the costs of this extraction. And so the image on the right is again about making the invisible visible. So it's using an infrared camera to look at some of the um, extraction equipment and, and actually be able to see the gases and the, the volatile organic compounds that are being emitted that you can't see with the naked eye, but that are very much having a negative impact both on people living close by and also um, exacerbating our regional air pollution problem. So development, oil, and then the final is agriculture. You may know that we are the most agriculturally productive region in the United States. Some historians would actually argue that the San Joaquin Valley today is the most agriculturally productive region that has ever existed in human civilization. And that comes with a lot of costs. We really have a very decimated landscape. If you look at images of the San Joaquin Valley 150 years ago with a lot of wetlands and oak trees and freely flowing rivers that really don't exist today. And industrialized agriculture creates a myriad of different sources of air pollution from open agricultural burning to the tractors that they use to the tens of millions of tons of pesticides that are applied to crops every year um, to the large animal, conf uh, the large confined animal feeding operations, the dairies, the turkey farms, the chicken farms that we have where you often have 10 and 20,000 animals in a very small concentrated place, and it's absolutely not sustainable. Um, so our tongue in cheek joke is that the, the three primary sources in the San Joaquin Valley development oil agriculture is DOA, also known as dead on arrival, because it the, all of these sources lead to very um, severe health impacts, right? We had epidemic levels of sickness caused by air pollution pre-COVID-19. Um, and these are just a few statistics to kind of lift that up and, and put, put some data uh, with what I'm talking about. So one out of four children in the San Joaquin Valley have asthma and compared to the national average, our children are twice as likely to be diagnosed with asthma before the age of 18. There's ample research showing that emergency room and hospital visits for ailments like asthma and heart attacks spike during days of unhealthy air pollution, which is why it's so critical that we inform our people and let them know how they can protect themselves as we strive for those longer term policy changes that are necessary to fundamentally change the situation so that ultimately we do restore clean air to the valley. And again, always with the acknowledgement, uh, recognition and emphasis on the fact that black and indigenous people and people of color and people with lower incomes are disproportionately exposed to these air pollution problems because those sources are concentrated um, in, in neighborhoods with people of color. So what we do as CVAC is help inform people how to protect themselves and their communities, our communities, and also create ways for people to be able to take action at the local level, at the regional level, and at the state level. Um, the San Joaquin Valley is a big region geographically, but politically we are um, 
not necessarily given a whole lot of attention at the state level because we have these large metropolitan areas that are much more well known and have a lot more decision making power. And so really appreciate being here today to be able to share a bit of the story of the San Joaquin Valley because I think it is one that potentially a lot of people have not heard about before. So an honor and a pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you um, to the organizers and I will pass it back over to Lael. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, there I am. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I love learning about just the impacts that we have and what the work is, is really needed for us to really tackle um, air quality. Um, I forgot to do my visual description, so I'm going to do that right now before I pass it over to Rostin. So I'm standing here, a brown person with dark hair, with um, black framed glasses and blue headphones, and my background is a white wall with some plants hanging on it. All right, so last but not least, we're going to hear from Rostin Wu about their work as a design strategist and educator and a writer. I'll hand it over to you. Hello, can, I view, can you hear me? Yeah. We got you, yes. All right, great. Um, hi, my name is Rostin Wu and I am a Chinese man wearing a yellow hat and a green shirt and there are some shelving and plants behind me and I'm wearing my hat because I still have not um, had a haircut this whole time. <laughs> so I'm trying to spare you my um, very wild hair. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about my work. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I think that's it. And um, basically you can think of what I do um, and I think of what I do as uh, is making diagrams. Um, but I try to make those diagrams um, in a very participatory uh, way, working with communities that are trying to make change um, for themselves and for, for others. Um, and I try to circulate those diagrams in ways that help people understand uh, the places that they live and how they are connected to larger systems, whether those are political or infrastructural and so on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a really old project. Um, Lael, when we were kind of prepping for this, was sort of asking, how do we get in, in, in first involved in AIR in any way? And I had to think back and I realized that the first thing I got involved with AIR on was uh, it actually is through garbage. So an organization that I co-founded in New York City called the Center for Urban Pedagogy, one of the things that that organization uh, does and did uh, is produce kind of like youth education programs, um, typically based kind of around um, real world, world questions, you know, things about, about the places that people live. Like, you know, where does this building come from? What's gonna happen to this vacant lot across the street? Um, where does my water go when I flush the toilet? Where does my garbage go? Where does my water come from? Those sorts of things. And kind of think of those programs uh, as, as a form of like civic education. Um, and you think about civics and how uh, it's typically taught, especially environmental education to young people. And it's typically very condescending, um, you know, where you have something like this, where it's like you have cartoon characters that are helped to like, you know, learn how to, you know, be an individual good citizen. Um, so we tried to figure out, is there kind of a model of environmental education, of civic education that would kind of be a little more engaging than kind of, uh, <laughs> than this. And so uh, the, the programs that we ran um, were called urban investigations, where we'd have these questions and then send people out um, with some skills to go and document the places they lived and figure out, you know, these questions about infrastructure. And we wanted to look at infrastructure because infrastructure is a concrete um, and great way to talk about politics. So as soon as you start asking questions about, you know, why is this pipeline here and not there? Um, why is this garbage facility here and not there? Um, you know, who gets to make decisions about it? Um, who cares about where this thing is? Um, you kind of get into all these political questions very quickly. So the model is basically find a question, go out, document it as in many ways as we can, and then try to build some sort of representations of those systems, whether they are, you know, stop motion animations or, you know, physical models or posters. Um, and then present those back and try to find um, people who could use those um, representations in their work. And so along the way, we often would meet different kinds of activists and then we'd build these kinds of charts, um, diagrams, things like this. This is like how waste decisions get made in, um, in New York City. This is sort of a diagram about landfilling versus uh, incineration. And this is one about where, um, where garbage facilities are located and why that might matter. Um, so in that, you know, and, another, and we made a film 
Um, so one of these films was about um, the specific situation in New York at that time where the city had closed its only landfill, Fresh Kills, and there was no uh, long-term waste management plan at the time. And so we went to go figure out like, what is the plan and, and what are the options that people have? And so we went and talked to people who were in the commercial waste hauling business, trying to design different waste hauling facilities. We talked to, you know, materials recyclers. And we talked to people um, like Omar Freya, who was at that time at Sustainable South Bronx um, doing environmental justice work um, and specifically trying to argue for an alternative place to place uh, marine transfer stations because of these reasons um, that were you know, brought up just moments ago uh, about you know, the, the impact that diesel trucks have on the community and the way that certain communities are asked to bear a very disproportionate amount of the burden for services that you know, we all share you know, in you know, also disproportionately, but typically we think of it as more equally. So you know, we all have to use the garbage system, but only some communities have to live with a waste hauling facility um, in their backyard, or maybe 15 waste haul hauling facilities in their backyard. Um, so when you think about this, um, the specific issue that they brought up was sort of the location of these waste transfer stations. Um, you know, each one, you know, any load of garbage actually equals four truck trips through the neighborhood, um, where you have sort of like a larger truck coming through to dump, um, uh, you know, from individual residences, and then these larger trucks that would cart it away to a place like Fresh Kills. And so you have a huge amount of diesel truck traffic going through those neighborhoods, and of course you have a correspondingly high rate of asthma. Um, so we think about um, infrastructure as a sort of like, you know, these are really basic things that we all use every day. But if you ask people, for instance, you know, where do you think your garbage goes right now? Most people are pretty hard pressed to actually answer those questions. Um, and so the model here is by kind of working with young people who, you know, maybe have those same questions, but maybe feel a little bit less um, embarrassed to not know the answers to them and are, are willing to go and investigate, you can kind of flesh out this whole kind of social uh, and political picture of the world you live in. And infrastructure is in fact, one of the most kind of effective ways to, to, to do that. So throughout my career, I've sort of worked in various ways, I think, and with different kinds of communities, whether it's, it's young people or people who are doing community organizing to do this kind of uh, collaborative research and diagram. So all these things, um, uh, are as 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 has been mentioned, you know, ways of making the invisible visible because we live in these systems that are so much larger than us that are so hard to kind of see, and air is a, a situation that it kind of exacerbates that. This is a you know just to kind of underscore the point. Some diagrams I've done, um, public education about uh, groundwater and how um, the water systems underneath LA work. Um, so back to air. Um, a few years ago, I was asked by the Exploratorium, which is a science museum in San Francisco, to produce some sort of work for them um, that would help them make, uh, I guess, make sense of a bunch of data streams that they co uh, collected. And if you know the Exploratorium, it's a science museum, it's sort of the first of its kind that it's really about um, people's ability to experience uh, physical phenomena in a direct way and then ask questions about it. And it's a really wonderful model. But typically you kind of think of an exploratorium type exhibit and it's like, you know, you hold your hand up and electricity comes out to meet it and you have all these questions of like, why is that happening? Um, and then you kind of like keep on experimenting and playing with something until you feel like you have a, a better sense of what's going on. And it's really about sort of observation of direct feedback. Now, you know, things like climate and the environment are, you know, really thwart that in ways that I think make for really complicated um, and, difficult politics that I think we're all all living through now, right? Where you, the, the impact of what we do or the, what is observable, you know, it doesn't have this immediate um, sensible interaction with it. Um, so trying to figure out how do you make kind of this data actually more engaging to people so they can see a, a chart and have some sort of sense of like, what does this mean? Or what's my interaction with it? And I became pretty fascinated with thinking about um, thinking about that data itself as a kind of infrastructure. And if there's a way to kind of build a social portrait of all the data that we collect about things like, um, like our global uh, carbon levels or particulate matter. Um, so I started making these films uh, about climate scientists. So first starting with people like uh, scientists at NOAA who are doing things like, you know, just tracking this, the global CO2 to produce something like the Keeling curve. And it took me to some really interesting places. Um, this is a monitoring station 
on, uh, on Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Um, and this is uh, uh, someone collecting an air sample in San Diego, um, where Dr. Keeling's lab um, still is. And you think about sort of all this infrastructure and all this kind of incredibly uh, boring, in a sense, uh, repetitive work and all this sampling that has to go into making something like a global portrait of air. So this is someone whose entire job is to kind of pack and send out these um, canisters of air to remote um, volunteers who are gonna take samples and send them back to the central lab. Um, for Noah, that's in Colorado. You know, so it's, there's something kind of funny about the idea that this person's whole job is sort of tracking what most of us would consider empty bottles um, in order to, to build a, a social portrait. And, you know, some of it seems like very heroic, like going up to the top of the mountain to collect the sample, but a lot of it is just very prosaic. Um, and it takes kind of a monk like dedication to produce these kinds of portraits. Um, so I made these kind of animations at play at the Explorer time to explain all of the work that goes into collecting this air quality data. But I also was interested in um, local air quality. So this is a, uh, a air quality monitoring station that's set up for uh, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, which is one of the first such kinds of uh, districts in the country. And um, Basically, it's this guy is going up to collect these screens that are on the roof in some ways very similar to, <laughs> to Kim's work. Um, he's making kind of a kind of smog portrait, um, basically collecting a filter that has had its, uh, PM 2.5 kind of rest on it. And then he's going to send that back to the lab. Again, this sort of like massive infrastructure um, just to kind of produce this, this, this baseline of, of air quality uh, information. But of course, the, the kind of politics of that infrastructure is itself really complicated. So um, I met someone like this um, uh, out in, oops, out in the Pittsburgh area, the Bay Quality. This is, her name is uh, Destiny Hober. And she was with a, a group called Freedom Breathers. At the time, you know, they're high school students that were arguing for, um, they wanted to have an air quality um, sensor installed in their in their neighborhood where one had just been closed down by the air quality management district. They thought they didn't have enough money to to monitor the air quality in that location anymore. So even the the you know let alone the politics of actually the air quality, there's a lot of politics just in sort of understanding what we know about air because it takes a lot of effort and work to collect data. Um, you know these things. So all of that kind of led eventually to a very local project in. Um, in West Oakland, um, when I met up with folks at an organization called the West Oakland Environmental Indicator Project. Um, and these were folks who um, were concerned with, um, with the air quality in West Oakland, which if you don't know, has a lot of, I'd say similar problems to the Central Valley, where you have oil refineries, you have a, a major port. And so you have all these different kinds of sources, you know, including trucks, including um, energy, uh, energy production that are spewing out um, all kinds of uh, particulate matter and black carbon. And so you have something like, you know, more than half of the children in West Oakland um, have asthma, you know, so that's just a kind of an astonishing uh, rate, um, though obviously a, at the same time, a very prosaic lived experience for millions of people um, in our country. And so the uneven distribution of, of what it, we often think of, you know, it's a kind of a truism that, you know, we all breathe the same air. Um, but that is, you know, just demonstrably very false, and it really matters where you're located and what what to what your air is like, as well as the time of day. So we were trying to think of, you know, is there a way to make the air quality in this neighborhood more apparent, more more readable for people? Um, and at the same time, I was reading this um, totally unrelated book um, called Village Bells that was about the soundscape of um, sort of medieval France. And the way that um, that the clock tower and the bell tower was this way of structuring everything about someone's life. So you know the bells would ring, and it would you know you'd know when to wake up and when to go out to the field, and when you came back, and when someone got married or when someone died. All of those things had like this auditory component that wasn't um, particularly present. It wasn't central to your um, your experience per se, but it structured everything else. And I got really interested in thinking about you know could you make some sort of way to um, to produce that sort of distributed um, auditory framing of a life. And I kind of connect that in some way with air quality. So we produced this project called Mutual Air in collaboration with the West Oakland Environmental Indicator Project and the Exploratorium um, that as it says here, it's you know, a network of chimes that reflect changes in the composition of local and global air. So 
these were installed. We had people volunteer to host these bells um, in their front yards or if they owned a business. Um, and we got, you know, the city of Oakland to put some up in their public parks um, at Lake Merritt um, and in downtown Oakland. And the way these things work, you, and, you know, the elevator pitch is just sort of think of them as like wind chimes for air quality. So they each have uh, like a, a small sort of inexpensive um, and, you know, these sensors, as you might imagine, are getting smaller and better all the time. You know, and they're finally at this point where, you know, buying a reasonably good PM 2.5 sensor that will work, you know, for six months is, you know, a fairly trivial cost now. I mean, and, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, that, that wouldn't have been the case. Um, so now you have all these kind of portable, easy to use um, sensors. And so we installed them with the solar panel and with the chimes um, and a kind of a ringer. So they would kind of be making measurements um, every uh, 30 seconds, they would make a new, new, new measurement, collect that data. And when it reached a certain levels, it would start to kind of play these chimes. And as um, the levels kind of got higher, the, the, the outer rings of the chimes kind of had a few more discordant notes. So this is one that's installed at the Oakland Museum. Here's some that are installed at the Oakland Library and at Lake Merritt. And the idea was to kind of create something that would be almost an ambient artwork. Um, people would at first barely notice them, or they would only notice them at certain times of day. And then over the course of several months, um, you know, the patterns to them and their signage that would help explain it. But the patterns would start to emerge of like which location started to, um, to chime more often, what times of day. Um, and they sort of meant to be kind of a provocation of it, sort of thinking about, you know, and I think all these things were, you know, this is in 2019, kind of prior to, you know, a lot of the worst um, campfires that were happening in the Bay Area prior to COVID. And at that time, it was sort of like, it felt very speculative, like, you know, what, you know, what is the kind of infrastructure that we might have or need in the, in the future for thinking about air quality? And is this sort of like a utopian idea or a dystopian? Um, how do we think about these kinds of solutions and, and what kind of information do people want to have um, about, about their environmental quality? Um, all those things kind of, I think, are way more forward in our minds, um, you know, both locally and globally. Um, and I guess we'll get into that in the conversation, but I'll leave that there. So hopefully I've dropped a few threads um, that we can pick up um, when we talk together. Thank you. Thanks, Ralston. Um, just amazing. And I have so many thoughts and questions and things that I might get to ask here, but probably won't be able to get to the whole time. But thank you so much. I'd like to bring the panelists back on. I mean, the yeah, the panelists back on. Oh. Hi, y'all. <laughs> I mean, such amazing people who have just been so dedicated to the work of air quality. And I always am amazed at how the intersectional points of everything from education to um, visual art and uh, policy advocacy just comes together. Um, and hearing what you all were saying, I'm really thinking about how does your work look like um, here during, we're in, a, we're in a global pandemic, so we're all living through COVID-19. Um, we have a lot of speculations how much longer we're going to be in this, looking at a global, a global scale and a micro scale. And so to that spirit, what have you all seen have been the impacts of air quality from the micro to the large scales to even your own community? Um, that you've noticed in this time. And I'd like to start off with Dr. Garupa White, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think COVID-19 has basically been a crisis layered on top of multiple other crises that our populations were already suffering under. Um, you know, I mentioned briefly in the presentation that we're also one of the poorest regions in the United States. So we have a real lack of healthcare infrastructure. We have a lot of service workers that are incredibly vulnerable. We've had massive outbreaks in a lot of the agricultural facilities where there wasn't proper social distancing, there wasn't proper masking. A lot of our people don't have the option to stay home and shelter in place, right? That's just not a thing that most essential workers were able to do. Um, it was interesting, I think, to see the temporary drop in emissions that happened in California when the lockdown initially happened that shows that there absolutely is potential to significantly reduce our footprint if we actually had the political and social will 
to make those types of longer term changes. So I think that's that is a bit of a ray of hope out of all of the darkness. But I think the, ch the ongoing challenge for the people of the San Joaquin Valley is um, just the, the deep intersectional layers of injustice that it, it's just like a never ending crisis and it becomes very difficult to have time to heal. Um, it's very difficult to come out of crisis mode. Uh, so a lot of our CVAC as a coalition and a lot of our grassroots environmental justice organizations had to immediately pivot to water deliveries, mask deliveries. Um, now they're doing vaccination clinics. They were trying to, you know, distribute checks to undocumented farm workers so that they could survive this crisis. So um, I think it has both kind of elevated those issues in people's minds, like Rostin was talking about the catastrophic wildfires, right? Then everybody on the West Coast was like, whoa, bad air, like we really have to do something about this. Um, so I think there are opportunities that we can leverage out of it. And at the same time, you know, I don't wanna minimize at all that our communities are, are suffering. They've been suffering for a really long time and this frankly has just made it worse. So we've had really high death rates um, and it's been among our Latinx population. It's been among our, our service workers and we have really low vaccination rates. So the disparities continue. Yeah, so the, there's that balance of like some of the hope, but also y'all, we still need to have attack this big problem that we've been dealing with. Rostin, I uh, would love to hear from you. Just what are the micro, the large scales and in your community impacts that we've been seeing? Sure. I mean, well, I mean, obviously no one needs me to tell them that that uh, there's a huge issue with, with the micro air quality and sort of people's ability to stay safe um, because of the air. Um, you know, I will say you know, to, to give like maybe a little bit more kind of micro detail, you know, part of the work that I do, I showed sort of my work that's more in the vein of public art, but a lot of the work I do is as a designer working with, um, you know, nonprofits and community organizations. And so one of the things I'm working on right now are um, worker worker education uh, materials um, and working with the coalition of people, you know, there have been these interesting health orders that have been produced um, from the state of California and from LA County, you know, basically creating stronger uh, OSHA protections, um, you know, related to the pandemic, but also one of the things that specifically is being added that's kind of an interesting leverage point for going forward is that there's, um, you know, much stronger uh, anti-retaliation protections, you know, so if a worker has issues with the, the their safety in the place that they're working, they have more protections about um, uh, about the worker, uh, their employer firing them if they if they complain or they want something to be changed. And so, even though you know most of these health orders will probably you know disappear and phase out in the next you know three or four months, this one might you know stick around longer, which I think you know is a leverage point for increasing people's ability to be safe. At, at work, and that relates to air quality, both in the micro of COVID, um, but also in you know in all these other other things. You know, as as um, Catherine was saying, sort of people who have to be out outdoors for huge amounts of time during the day. You know, all these other kinds of ways that people are put at at harm. You know, repeatedly by their by their employers. Such. Um such important work that is necessary because all these small things that COVID has allowed us to push the line on is actually gonna to translate to how we organize around air quality in the long run. I mean, that's, that's yeah. great hope. So similarly to you, Kim, how does this question land for you around what you've been noticing around the impacts on air quality during COVID? Um, yeah, uh, first I have to say I was alarmed how quickly our smog came back when they opened things up. I mean, it was like a day and night. And if anybody wants to question, is it cars and trucks that are a prominent feature of the smog? You could see it from one day to the next. So I do want to put that out there. And also um, in 2019, I worked for six, with, for six months with uh, incarcerated women who do firefighting for us in California. Uh, these were the women at Camp 13. Uh, the uh, prison is up in the Santa Monica Mountains. And, um, you know, the, the connection between the air pollution and the fires is, uh, you know, very obvious, especially if you're near where fires are happening. Uh, during uh, last year, we had the Bobcat fires over the ridge from where I live in Pasadena. And uh, I actually put on my rooftop smog collectors in the images of 
deck chairs from the Titanic because there's a part of me that thinks the ship is going down and, you know, between the, you know, pandemic and our environmental issues, it was really a convergence there of, you know, uh, how we we're not like thinking about a, dip, a tipping point anymore. We are in the tipping point. And I think that's so important in a lot of uh, both Catherine and Rostin's, you know, presentations really uh, show that. And I just, the thing about the fires, I just also want to say after working with those women for so long, we were making uh, suitcases and valises that the National Park Service take around to teach about firefighting. And I got a little discouraged in the middle of the project, like, you know, the fires are blazing throughout California and I want to take these suitcases out to like teach people something. It, but you know what? More than 90% of the fires are caused by human error and mistake. And I think in, it, it's back to the infrastructure problem again and just teaching people as Rostin called it, you know, like civic engagement and civic education. It, if, we're doing this and it's a climate issue, of course, has made, caused these droughts, but if humans aren't realizing their tractors, you know, spark something because a piece of metal hits and it, you know, the place goes up or if somebody puts a cigarette butt out, you know, and in minutes. So anyway, the hopeful sign is that if we can just educate people on their role and also put pressure on leadership, to me, that's sort of the direction to go in. I love that reflection, Kim, and I thank you for bringing that project back because it seemed like such a dire time to be really experimenting and thinking creatively so we can have something to look for in the future. And then I'll add on to what you said also, utility companies, because they've been, they've been seen as such big culprits for these large wildfires. Um, this next question is kind of more specific to you, Dr. Garupawai, is what does it look like when you say that you are like a watchdog for air quality and how can everyday people support that work and or become watchdogs themselves? Yeah, that's a great question. Really appreciate it because definitely the focus of what CVAC does is really trying to engage people in that watchdog role. Um, and part of why CVAC formed was out of a recognition that because we have a regional air district and then a state air resources board that the community level stories and community level impacts weren't always being heard. Um, and that we really needed to build solidarity across the region, especially among marginalized and oppressed people to build power to push back against these incredibly powerful forces, right? The oil industry, the ag industry in California are incredibly wealthy and powerful. They have absolutely an outsized role in our politics. Mm -hmm. And so what we have in response is people power. Um, so again, you know, it fundamentally starts with protect yourself. We want the long-term changes. We're fighting together for the long-term changes. And at the same time, you know, I think what we've been talking about is the fact that proximity really matters, right? The closer you are to pollution sources, the higher the dose, the more it's a chronic and cumulative exposure, because again, people are, are living in communities where there are multiple different sources and science hasn't caught up with the reality of what it means to be exposed to pesticides and oil and gas extraction and heavy duty diesel truck traffic altogether, right? Those are often studied in isolation. So where we focus on watchdogging is really on our air cleanup plans and the rules that are in those plans that in theory are supposed to get us to clean air standards. And we've consistently seen a failure, right? The San Joaquin Valley Air Basin hasn't even achieved 1997 standards for particulate matter. So even though those standards are always being updated based on the best available science, we are clearly very behind. Um, and in large part, it's because of the outsized role of industry in the decision-making bodies on the governing board of the Valley Air District at the Air Resources Board in the state legislature. So we mobilize and engage people in meeting with their decision makers in holding those agencies agencies accountable for actually enforcing the rules on the books. California has this outsized reputation of being this amazing environmental leader, and yet we still have some of the worst problems and the deepest environmental injustices in California. So, you know, that's a, that's a stark contrast and that's a story from the San Joaquin Valley that we have to continually uplift and tell to people who say, well, isn't California great? Don't you have the best rules and plans? 
but if they only live on paper, they don't matter. Um, and what we see is that these agencies are constantly creating loopholes, exemptions, pay to pollute schemes where the industry is just handing them some money and then they're going to then they're going to give it back to them in incentive dollars so that they can go buy themselves new equipment and claim that it's cleaner um, and claim <laughs> that those are reductions. So, you know, we really push for that type of enforcement for the long-term change in the legislature that we need and for the immediate protections that we've heard again and again from our communities. Health and safety zones, right? People work in the oil industry, they work in the ag industry. Nobody is saying like completely get rid of them but plan a phase out for the oil industry that's dying. Plan um, protections, right? Move places so that people aren't in proximity, add vegetative barriers, put in trees in, in our communities of color and low-income communities where we know that there's not tree canopy. So we're constantly pushing on both sides, right? We want the proactive investments and justice for our communities. We want the immediate protections. And we want these agencies that claim this outsized title of being environmental leaders to actually do their jobs. Yeah, I mean, as you were talking, I was like, let's turn all of your talking points into a rap song. Let's make that rap song go viral just because the arts helps like stimulate everything to a higher setting. Uh, so I'm just like, yeah, I, I want all that. I want to keep hearing that so I can like help and be the best watchdog I can from here in Wichita territory. Uh, thank you so much for that. I just like, I got, I got so excited. Um, so my question, <laughs> and because of the arts and intersecting about policy advocacy, this next question is going to go for Ross. And my question is, how do you work with scientists and with infrastructure towards incorporating your discipline? Like, it just seems like you're probably constantly weaving in different networks to get the data and to create your products. Um, yeah, I mean, sure. But thank you for that question. I mean, I think this is, you know, I guess I think of all those kinds of people as being really related, you know, so they're different, there's different kinds of expertise, you know, and I, I think some of this comes from, you know, I think my entryway into a lot of this work was through kind of urban planning and thinking about infrastructure in, in that way of like, what are, what are, you know, everyday people's kind of um, expertise and understanding what kind of place they want to live in, you know, so certainly something like air quality is really complex and there is um, real technical knowledge that's there. Um, but I also feel like there is there is lived experience that's also really complex, and there's a lot to bring there. So you know, I guess I try to think of each of these kinds of communities as, um, you know, different people have different skills, different perspectives, and different knowledge bases that they that they bring to bear on a, a very shared situation. So I think a lot of the work I do is kind of like a, sort of like translation, you know, and it kind of goes both ways. It's not just like oh, there's scientists over here. I have to like get the science data and like translate it and then send it out to like a community like it's like actually people who are living next to an oil refinery know that their air is bad and they know a lot about <laughs> what is going on with the diesel trucks and whether they are you know on their streets or not you know and that's something that whatever a regulator might look at on paper and be like oh well you know as the captain's saying like oh well like they're not supposed to be there so if they're not there and it's like actually they are you know <laughs> and so i think a lot of it is about trying to figure out um these forms that allow different people to participate and um, make make themselves, I guess, seen to one an another. Um, so I think those are, you know, that's the way I sort of think about how, how to assimilate any kind of knowledge base. And there's, and there's different, different forms and they're all really valuable. Thanks for that, Ross. Thanks. That makes me think about how, when it comes to climate solution and environmental issues, we always throw the scientists, like they're the ones, they're the ones who are gonna lead us. And we forget about the frontline workers, we forget about the cultural workers, forget about the organizers. It's just, it's, it's such a community collaborative process. And in the community, there's also artists and cultural workers. And I was wondering, Kim, have you, how did artists and cultural work, workers come together in the pandemic? Did you notice? a strong more connection between artists or was it difficult to continue to create work during this pandemic which really limited our outside space it limited our ability to create and be able to um collaborate together was it was it something that you noticed during the pandemic that just shifted around the artist community everything from coming together to maybe needing to be more creative uh yeah i actually saw it as a pretty positive in in terms of a strange, unexpected leveling of the playing field. Suddenly everybody's on Zoom and you can join in and a lot of international connections 
could be easily made. I mean, I just hope people keep continue to do this. You know, typically I would be th flown thousands of miles to go present what I'm presenting to you today, right? So I think it was about that, but it was also um, that leveling of the playing field was about everybody being in the same uh, situation, right? So that, you know, the only disparity that I was really seeing, um, my husband uh, does a lot of work uh, through the uh, right wounded knee in, with the Lakota and, and had organized a bunch of panels uh, for his exhibit of the work. And, uh, you know, so if you think of on reservations, sometimes the internet's not so handy, you know, on, on all sorts of levels. And to me, that was, that was sort of a striking thing that I did see woven in. However, we all assume we've all got internet fast internet and a computer that's working. And when I've done workshops with schools and stuff through the pandemic, that wasn't always the case. So for me, that was also a wake up call about an inequity that needs to be fixed as well. That's a big one because that's about how we all connect and how we do mobilize a community, right? So, um, so, that that was an awakening it's not you know all these things aren't stuff it's not stuff you don't know already but I think we had time to really uh absorb this information in a very profound and personal way and I think through the whole last year there was a lot of self-reflection going on about what's my role what's really my role or what does it look good on paper you know yeah, yeah, totally. I think COVID really opened up a lot. And you're right. I didn't really think about this like equal playing field. Rostin, did you have something to add as a fellow artist around that question? No pressure and no worries. If you didn't, we can move on to the next. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I have some thoughts. You know, I, I mean, I think I think I, I agree with what, what Kim is saying, especially, you know, relating to, I think this being a moment you know, just like a real convergence of a lot of different kinds of crises. And I think people, uh, I think I experienced, you know, really mostly in, you know, in May and June through the, the work of Black Lives Matter, you know, I think as many people in America did sort of like this, this kind of like a remarkable shifting of the ground, I think for a lot of people of like seeing like things that, you know, didn't seem particularly possible or something that would be a mainstream conversation you know, at all, suddenly have like huge traction. Um, and, and it really does feel like a reckoning that, you know, I've, I haven't experienced that much of a shift in my, you know, 40 years of, of living, of feeling like, oh, like, you know, two months ago, no one really wanted to talk about reparations, you know, and now that seems like something you have to talk about, you know, and obviously, there's still so much work to be done. But, it, it really is a change. And I feel like, you know, I think there's, there's parallels to that across you know, all, all, all modes of, um, of work. You know, I think the other thing that I've, I've really seen, you know, in my community, you know, is this kind of turn to, um, you know, really local forms of things like mutual aid, um, ways that people, you know, in, in some ways, you know, it's hard to, you know, I really hate the term like resiliency, you know, just like, it's like, I, you know, I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather not have to be resilient, you know, like, like, I don't, I, I, I don't want that to be the bar where it's like, okay, well, we can just like withstand like the next horrible thing that happens to us. And that's the best thing we can say for ourselves. But I do feel like people's idea of like, how are we going to get to a solution has really shifted and people realizing, okay, this is not necessarily going to come from without this, you know, these things are not going to get solved with from without. And I think, you know, that's something that I've felt like I've had to reckon with in my work. And I feel like, you know, all of us probably in some way, you know, the idea of like, um, awareness raising, I feel like in some ways it feels like that's over. Like everybody know, like it's, <laughs> everybody knows that this is not okay. Like th that we're living in a world that is not sustainable and this, this is, this can't happen. So it's sort of like, well, what is the role then of this kind of work that can be something beyond just sort of like letting people know that there's these horrible inequities. Like we all know that that's true. How do we start using these arts to kind of point to these other ways of being these other, re other realities that we need to bring, bring forth. Um, so I think that's something I see a lot of people doing in, in, in different ways. I mean, someone, I think one of the questions I saw on your list is sort of like other work that you see that's inspiring you. 
Um, you know, the artists like someone like Lauren Halsey working in South Central Los Angeles, there's a real continuity between her sculptural work, um, celebrating and loving the place that she lives, and then the development of like this huge food distribution and water distribution network. And there's this way that that cultural work is so tied to the distribution of these basic services. You know, I think something I really believe in is sort of like, um, you know, there's that quote um, that's sometimes used. It's like, we have no art, we do everything as well as we can. You know, that it's sort of like this idea that like, why should there be this distinction between artwork and, and cultural work and the work that we just do to survive, you know? So I think that we're kind of in this, I feel like that mode is really emerging where people see like, okay, I'm not really, I don't need to make any fine art that like lives in a cultural sphere only, you know, this work has to be integrated into all of all of the things that we're doing. So that's something that I, I feel is, is growing and I, I, I really love seeing those expressions of that um, in, in where I live. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm so glad that you took it there because you really did kind of bring the full flavor of how nuanced it's been and also the possibilities of everything that we've been seeing. I, I too agree that a lot of rhetoric and pedagogical uh, ideological thinking that just stayed in organizing or activist circles really did mesh itself into more mainstream dialogue. So this brings me back to kind of my roots of climate organizing, which is around the Just Transition Framework. Um, and I know Dr. Garupa White, you organized around the Just Transition Framework on anti-fracking back when you were getting your doctorate. And I was curious, how do you incorporate Just Transition um, Frameworks into your work? You did mention briefly like that BIPOC communities are predominantly impacted by air quality infrastructure, uh, uh, infrastructure that leads to poor air quality. And so just like curious, how do you weave it into your work now? Um, the, this idea of a just transition, which is a big one. So if folks haven't heard about it, feel free to look up organizations that talk about it. My favorite are Climate Justice Alliance or Movement Generation. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to pass it on to see if you wanted to just tell us a little bit about how that weaves in. Yeah, absolutely. So even though CVAC is a regional coalition, we really strive to be rooted in our environmental justice communities and recognize that the three root causes that I described of development, oil and agriculture are the primary employers of the people of the San Joaquin Valley. And the oil industry in Kern County is providing 20 to 25 percent of their tax base uh, that they use to fund services for their population. So, you know, Everybody has a, a relationship to these industries, right? Everybody is touched by these industries. And I think um, oftentimes, you know, when people hear the word fracking, they or even just in environmental issues generally in the very libertarian conservative political climate of the San Joaquin Valley, we're constantly cast as like these tree hugging hippies from the Bay Area who are who have no idea idea about the reality of the San Joaquin Valley. And I'm constantly asked by oil lobbyists, well, then what is your solution for jobs? Um, so we're fully aware of the fact that this is not an easy transition, that it has to be a just transition, that it has to center workers and local economies, and that it has to be done with, with those sectors and those people at the table leading the conversations about what this is going to require. The oil reserves are going to be depleted, right? It's been on the decline in the Monterey Shale in Kern County since the 1980s. So the transition is already happening. Um, and one of my colleagues in labor said, the transition is inevitable, justice is not. So we work very hard to be very explicit about the fact that we want the health and safety zones, right? Because it's not just that our communities are asked to shelter in place right next to these massive sources of air toxics. We need the long-term phase out and it has to be planned because if it's not, it's gonna be messy and it's gonna leave out workers. Um, and also to see it as an opportunity, right? Like the research and analysis that our colleagues at um, organizations like Center on Race, Poverty and the Environment that is based in Delano in Kern County have looked at, have shown that our oil field workers are aging out, that a lot of the specialized and well-paying jobs are people that are flown in from other places. So we have an opportunity now to create new jobs and new opportunities for the young people that are now the vast majority of the workforce and are having difficulty finding job right now. So how can we leverage this as an opportunity to create the sustainable reality that we want, right? Kern County has an abundance of sunshine. Where can we bring the solar panels, right? Um, the Tehachapi's are particularly well positioned for wind power. 
So how do we bring in the things that we want to see as we plan to draw down the practices of these industries that aren't sustainable in a way that recognizes that workers and economies will be adversely impacted unless we do it thoughtfully? Thank you. I just love that it's when you speak, you speak knowledge to power. When you talk, I'm like, yeah, let's go do it. I don't know why when you speak, I'm like, I feel activated. Um, and so with that being said, we're, we're handling a lot of themes here, everything from the pandemic, air quality to artists and the cultural workers practice. Um, and so I see that we have a Q&A from our audience, so we're going to come to that. But before that, I wanted to give Kim just this one specific question that is like, it needs to be asked for me. It's like, I saw your amazing smog portraits, and I also know that you've been internationally recognized by this work. And I'm curious. Does your work vary depending on location because of smog pollution and how do you navigate that? And I think specifically why this question is so dear to my heart is uh, cultural workers and artists just they help heal and transform the world. And I think specifically us we're in this pandemic but we can kind of see an ending to it, just really helping illuminate and expand how we can become more global artists and global creators and global organizers and adjust as we need it. So I wanted to hear you as an example of that. Oh, oh, sure. Okay, thanks, Leo. Um, yeah, I, you know, um, they definitely change regardless of where I put them. And I don't know, because I went through that slide, those slides so quickly, but um, about six of those world leaders, I found somebody that I didn't maybe personally know to put the smog portrait stenciled on their roofs, uh, Theresa May had to be about the worst in London. Uh, so, you know, it, it depends on the location. Uh, Long Beach and I have had a constant like no show because it's so bad down there with the shipping and, and the diesel that they're always trying to, you know, ix name my my project because they don't want to they don't want to fess up to the pollution down there so some of it I get stopped by oil you know fuel and oil companies um, another example because of your question that crosses my mind sometimes I was asked to do these smog works in like resort towns like Santa Barbara and I'd say, well, I don't know what it'll be like because you have this image in your head sometimes of what a location is like. You think, ooh, fresh ocean air. Those had to be some of the worst smog collection images that I have done because what do you get at a resort town? You get cars and trucks. And, and so much of that pollution is from that in addition to, of course, like I've, we've all said, the factories. So that, that comes up as an issue. Um, during the pandemic, I did some indoors. I made small collectors in quarantine, so to speak. And again, the interior spaces that we have when we have studios next to factories factories or downtown and so on uh, does accumulate on that way. But I, I, I just want to close your, you know, in answering your question that, um, and maybe this connects to really both speakers, Catherine and Rostin, that some of it, this is really about not the outcome of the piece, but the process, like that interaction between people. You've got to convince somebody, can we do this on your roof? Or, you know, we've got to convince somebody of what's the relevance between you and your polluted air. So I, I, for me, the process is often the more critical part and that outcome product is really just something that happens at the end. Thank you, I love that. And that takes us to this very organically into this question from Constance um, to specifically for Rostin and Kim in creating opportunities for civics engagement. Again, thinking about how you work with people, uh, it seems easier to work with younger people. What creative ideas do you have for drawing in adults? Uh, and is, 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 this, is this a proper question? Are there some assumptions there that maybe you all wanna clarify um, as, as you're answering, but which one of you two wants to go first? Um, I, I can I can go. Um, yeah, that's a great question. 
I think that, you know, I think part of why it's easier to work with young people is because like we've created all these structures where young people are kind of held in spaces where they're often really bored. And so you can, you can, you can work with them. They're there. Um, and we don't necessarily have the same kinds of spaces when you're an adult, you've got like, you have to go to work. You can't, you don't have, you know, we don't, we haven't built a society where people have the free time to like engage in like these <laughs> exploratory questions. Um, so a lot of times I, you know, so that's, you know, one answer is, is there's that kind of macro problem, but then in terms of like, how do you kind of like, you know, obviously you can, in fact, you know, work with, with adults and, and get them, you know, engaged and turned on to something. And I find that often, you know, there's sort of two things like one, you know, if you can make it the stakes really clear to them, you know, so a lot of the work that I do is actually in sort of an organizing context where, you know, something's happening in their neighborhood or at their workplace or whatever. Um, and they actually do really care about it because it really is going to affect them in an extremely direct way. <laughs> um, and so I feel like a lot of times, you know, all you need to do is sort of actually figure out a way to describe it. It's like this actually, you know, a engage like their own cynicism about what can change, but also connect them to things, you know, examples of seeing like, okay, this is this was actually done in this other warehouse or this was done in this other neighborhood. Like we actually can can create the change that we want. So I think if you can kind of produce, you know, do both of those things. And and you know, I think most people are kind of allergic to, you know, kind of like generic like do-gooderism <laughs> makes sense. You know, like just like you should care about the air. Like no one wants to deal with that. Um, but if you show them like, this is actually like what, what is happening to you right now. Um, I think that's one way. I think another thing is, you know, I think one of the, the things I like about making work that is more in, I guess, art is stuff that is, um, that is in this more ambiguous space where I think it, it is not immediately interpretable of like, this is what this means. Um, but it asks a question or, you know, proposes something that, that requires further investigation. And I think that is, a really sure far way to kind of engage a different part of someone's mind and heart to kind of get them to to think about why why is my world the way it is um so i think that there's there's both of those those strategies i, I think that that is sort of where um to me like why art you know part of why art is so enduringly of interest to me despite you know my really direct interest in all these kinds of kind of political and organizing issues is there is a way that it really can um, open up something um, that you can't do through a pamphlet. You can't do through just, you know, I often sort of say like, you can't, you can't always go in through the front door about trying to change someone's mind. Go ahead, Kim. Oh, sure. Uh, well, one thing I will say about the, the, the positive thing about working with kids, kids really do influence their adults around them. And so I, I, I really am sometimes reliant on those kids thinking they're going to pass the baton after I pass it to them. Uh, so I go with that. The other thing that I, uh, you know, when I make those valises, like the firefighting valises, you know, when the Rangers and the fire, uh, uh, LA County Fire Department educators take him around, this idea of taking the art to people. You know, like as artists, I think typically people think, okay, I'm going to have this gallery show and I'm reliant on all these people coming in there. And that grows old really fast. It's like, I know my mother likes my work. Okay. It's like, I need more than that. And, and to me, if you can make it mobile in any kind of way of taking the work to where the people are, you know, to the park where they are you already having a picnic or and it takes a little bit of courage to like you know you start feeling like pt barnum or a barker like you know hey everybody i got this thing i want to show you but but you know what people rally around very openly i mean human beings on one-on-one -on -one are awesome regardless of their politics it's when they group together that you know, it gets confusing, but if you can like one and -on one share this weird art thing and engage in the conversation, it goes miles in, in my experience, pretty, pretty positive, like spin for me on that. Thank you. And then I, I was wanted to expand the question to you, uh, Dr. Gerber White is, do you, how do you make your work multi-generational? Is that something that you could pass some tips on to the audience that's watching right now? 
Yes, and that is hugely important for our success is being inclusive and really um, being multi-generational, being able to retain that institutional knowledge so we're not having to reinvent the wheel and kind of start from scratch. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's offering opportunities for people to engage at whatever level they're comfortable with. Uh, I think a big piece of the work that we do in um, that I think really connects with what Rostin and Kim are describing is building those connections between people, building those connections between communities across the San Joaquin Valley so people no longer feel isolated. You know, I grew up in the San Joaquin Valley. I had asthma and I was kind of like, well, I can't choose to not breathe the air, so whatever, right? Um, and how I ended up in air quality work, to go back to your original question, is I got a job at the Central Valley Air Quality <laughs> And I naively came into it thinking, oh, the, the environment is unifying because we do all breathe the same air, right? As a privileged white person, I didn't recognize the disparities um, and I had to learn. And I also had to recognize that it wasn't a question of the science. It was a question of political will, right? If, if we, we have the solutions, it's actually making it happen. So I think building those connections across the different generations to create that cross-pollination, that ability to learn and hear you know, people's different perspectives, I think, uh, storytelling and narratives is such an important and powerful part of the work because um, especially for low income communities and communities of color, they are constantly told it's jobs versus the environment, you know, do you want to have a job or do you want to breathe clean air, which is a false choice right justice says that we can and should have a healthy environment and good jobs with a livable wage that can support a family. Um, and for communities in crisis, we need to be together creating those visions of what we do want for our communities um, to say, you know, this is what we will replace those things with. This is what we will transition those things to because ultimately what we're hoping to achieve is to, to build our movement to the point where we tip the, the political well, right? We tip the scales towards justice and we really start to fundamentally see those changes at the ground level. So it takes everybody, um, whatever their comfort level, whether it's they wanna help out at the workshop distributing materials, they wanna testify at hearings and share their story, they wanna meet with decision makers. We do our best to um, connect with people and offer them opportunities for engagement wherever they're at. Um, and opportunities to learn, heal, and grow together. Thank you. I just that just makes me think about just so many things that are that we all have a role in this. Like there, there is the like the naive perception we all breathe there, therefore we should all protect it. But then there is the reality. Most of, there are a group of us that look a certain way, that are impacted by racism, classism, ableism, that are mostly susceptible and do live in these places where our life expectancy is compromised because of the air quality. So I feel like there's this balance of we're all in it together. And also there's a couple of us that, there's a few of us that definitely experience it at high rates. I wish I could stay in this conversation for longer. I just love this like multidiscipline, but we are kind of running out of time. I wanted to give a big shout out to Tessa. Tessa has been doing graphic recording this whole time that we've been talking, hi. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to Netanel. Uh, who is going to give us kind of a wrap up and let us know where we can find everything from this recording to Tessa's amazing graphic recording. But thank you so much, Kim. Thank you so much, Dr. Catherine Garupa White. Love your name, love how long it is, love how it takes up that space. And Rostin, it's been a pleasure to see you all again and talk about this. Netanel? Thank you so much, Lyell. Thank you, Rostin, Kim, and Catherine. Really just my, my mind is just going in so many different directions, but really, um, Catherine, what we said, what you just said, that we just need to continue to learn, to grow, and to heal together across generations, um, across the world. Um, it's just, this was a really powerful conversation. Thank you all so much. Um, we have another, another um, session actually this afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern time, so in about half an hour. Um, in this session, Mural Arts is Environmental Justice Department will facilitate a live implosion, a creative participatory research tool for building coalitions and exposing the hidden connections that fuel systems of environmental injustices. Um, it's a really, really exciting thing to be a part of, um, to, to even just to watch. Um, so I encourage folks to join us there in about half an hour, but really thank you all so much for this conversation today. Thank you also Tessa for your awesome um, illustrating and, and uh, visual note taking there. We can't wait to see it finished and to share it all with you all here with us today. So thanks so much. There are a couple, 
more days of the symposium and we'll see you again soon.